Well, welcome back to the 700 Club. It's time to bring it on with your email questions. And Wendy so graciously asks us this. She says, I have a friend who I've witnessed to since he became a Christian. I told him that he needs to be baptized. He said he hasn't done it yet because he hasn't found the right church. I told him that he doesn't need a pastor. Anyone can do it for him in a river or a pool. So he asked me to perform the baptism. After pondering this a little bit more, I'm a little worried that I've misguided him. Did I give him poor information? Well, yes and no. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that says that somebody has to be, quote, an ordained minister in order to baptize somebody. Uh, you read in the Bible of people who did baptisms, but the last thing you want to do is start baptizing your boyfriend. Not cool. I, I just think it, it sets up a wrong relationship. You need to have somebody who's, you know, third party uh, objective. It's nice to have a minister, to have somebody who's a clergyman, but it, there's nothing in the Bible that I can read that indicates that somebody has to be ordained in order <clears throat> to baptize. All right? Okay. Um, Olivia writes in and she says, I've recently started suffering from bad anxiety and constant worrying. I feel like I'm sad all the time. I try to take the negative thoughts out of my head, but some days they just consume me. I pray every night and I go to church every Sunday. I even go to my church by myself just to pray for God's healing. What prayers can I say or what can I do that could help me get through this? All right. The joy of the Lord we can leave that up on the screen for there we go. Uh, the joy of the Lord is your strength, and you need to be filled with the joy of the Lord. I will praise the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Mm -hmm. You need to be praising God. Lord, I praise you. I thank you. I bless you. In your heart, as you're going to work, I praise the Lord. But instead of that, you're focusing on fighting bad thoughts. You know, don't be you consume yourself, the negative will take you even if you're fighting them. Mm. So don't do it, but have an attitude of praise. I am rejoicing the Lord. God has blessed me. This is the day the Lord hath made. Mm. Say things. If you need to get scriptures like that, write them down, post them on your refrigerator, in your bathroom, wherever you are. You know, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continue to be in my mouth. I mean, just that kind of thing. And uh, let your thoughts go in that direction, but don't be focusing on, I've got to fight the bad thoughts, mm -hmm. because the bad thoughts will get you. All right. Okay, next one from Anonymous. There is one viewer. He says, there's a man in our office who's been with the company for many years. He's in his early 80s and doesn't care to keep up with the current technology. He even says that it's so impersonal and not the way they used to do it. He's holding us back and advancing and streamlining our efforts. Is there anything in Scripture to guide us and how we should deal with this man? Well, in Scripture, they retired the... Um Levites, uh, they, they served from 30 to 50, and after that, they didn't serve actively in the temple anymore. You know, I'm in my early 80s, too, and I must say that that gentleman should have been put on the shelf. You ought to give him a nice gold watch, shake his hand, give him his pension, thank him so much, have a party for him, have a nice banquet, everybody cheers, and then out the door. I mean, you just now, of course, in this age discrimination, there has to be a policy, I suppose, that says retirement age. You know, for many companies, it used to be 65, and 70. And this guy's in his 80s. Uh, you know, technology has passed him by. But you see, is there anything in the Bible? Read about the Levites. In the temple, they serve between 30 and 50. Goodbye. But I, I don't know about retiring. I, I guess that. Do, they always say that to me. Well, why don't you go sit on a bench and think good thoughts? Okay. <laughs> Chrissy won't let me retire, will you, darling? Yes, she will. All right, what's next? Byron says, if God is all powerful, why did he take six days to create everything? I mean, why not speak everything in existence all at once? This is something my son asked me, and I don't have the answer. Well, God could have. He's all powerful. But um, at the same time, how would we have been able to understand if creation took as long? It didn't take six days. Uh, I hate to tell you, it took a long time, and various processes took place. And, and you know, for example, how did we get oceans here on this earth? Well, we probably got hit by uh, some uh, uh, planetary uh, uh, phenomenon uh, like a comet that was filled with ice and it had water. Um, 
uh, something had to hit us and spin, spin off a moon. The moon is important to the, to the earth. Well, uh, all those processes, God doesn't short circuit the processes of life anymore. He could create you full grown, but he doesn't. He starts out with a little egg and the sperm puts them together. A little, little embryo grows, then the little baby grows, and then the little baby gets older, and then he begins to toddle, he begins to walk, and then before long he begins to speak, and his, his mind is formed. How does that, why didn't God just put him out there 32 or 35 and 40, whatever? He could. But that's not the way God works. He works with processes, and He works through the normal maturation of plants and seeds and birds and human beings and creation. So, yes, He could have. That's what you tell your child. Sure, He could have. He had the power to say, all right, let it all be perfect. And, but then how would it continue? Mm -hmm. How would the next generation continue? He set in motion a, a self-sustaining universe where the animals and the people and the plants could renew themselves and, and have that creation. Okay, so much. Okay. Final right. question. Sherry says, could you please clarify why believers say that God gave his only begotten son to be crucified for our sins? Where does the Trinity fit into that? And wasn't Jesus a part of God? And when I witness to people, I stay away from this because really it confuses me. Oh. The Trinity is true. It's a very hard thing to understand. But um, God is eternally existent in three persons. The Father is the creative thought. The Son uh, is the agent of creation. The Holy Spirit is the life of God flowing through creation and bringing the power of God to play. Uh, where was God? Uh, he, the Trinity was there. You know, when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, um, the Holy Spirit came, sat on him like a dove. The Father speaks to him from heaven. This is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. Uh, there's the Son in the water being baptized. They're all there together. Uh, so, uh, at the crucifixion, I'm not quite straight sure what that question was. Would you explain it to me one more time, what exactly they were trying to find you out? You know what, I was thinking the same thing. It says, could you please clarify why believers say that God gave his only begotten son to be crucified for our sins? That's question one. Where does the Trinity fit into that? Which is question two, but the Trinity is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Wasn't Jesus a part of that? Yes, Jesus was a part of that. When I witness to people, I stay away from this. The bottom line is you've, you've got the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy right. Ghost. We know that Jesus well, is the I, Son I, of God. I, I, I think that's it, and, and yeah. uh, His beloved Son. Uh, yeah. You know what? Uh, it was a confusing he was question. The, the Son of God. It's confusing because the Trinity is a mystery, folks. It really is. I mean, but but be careful. Of one thing. It's so easy to say. Well, it's water, steam, and ice. Mm. Uh uh. Uh uh. There are three. They don't. The Trinity doesn't become, the Father doesn't become the Son, the Son doesn't become the Holy Spirit. They're all three separate beings, eternally existent. In, they're one, but externally existent in three separate people. And uh, I don't know what else to say, except mm -hmm. that's the way it is. All you right. know, when we were little, we learned that it was an egg. In Sunday school, they would say, think of the Trinity as an egg. You got the yolk, you got the um, white, and you got the shell. I don't know. I was in third grade. I'm just saying. All right, I'm going to switch. <laughs> You're giving me that look. I know that look, Pat. Okay. So I'm going to. All right, I will not comment on that because it's time to take a break.